Funding for this program was provided in part by Brigham Young University Religious Education. Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this session of the Sperry Symposium. I'd like to introduce Richard D. Draper. He's a professor of ancient scripture and managing director of the Religious Studies Center. And he, he was raised in Utah Valley. Upon graduation from Pleasant Grove High School, he served for 18 months in the US Army, completed a mission in the Central Atlantic States, North Carolina and Virginia, received his B BA in history from BYU, his MA, in history from Arizona State University and his PhD in ancient history from BYU. He began teaching in the church educational system in 1968 and joined the BYU faculty in 1988. He has published five books and over 100 articles as chapters in books, encyclopedias, or symposia proceedings. He is married to Barbara Ella, Ellen Johnson Draper and they have six children. His talk is entitled, I have even from the beginning declared it to thee, prophecy as a means through which God authenticates himself. And I'll turn the time over to him now. Thanks, Margie. Uh, brothers and sisters, I like prophecy. I like, I like prophecy ever since I first discovered prophecy. I remember uh, I was a sophomore in, at Pleasant Grove High School, and I had a teacher that year that, that loved prophecy, and he brought prophecy to me, and I've enjoyed prophecy ever since then. I've kind of made it one of my little hobbies to study prophecy. Uh, some years ago, I asked myself, what is it about prophecy that I find so intriguing? Why am I continually drawn back to prophecy? And I decided that the reason was, I am basically a very insecure person. And uh, a, a future out there that I just don't know anything about is very frightening. I am kind of a control freak and I like everything nice and secure and tight and I know, like to know that things are going to get done and therefore, I like to know that everything is going to wrap up in the future very tightly. You know, it's all going to come together and it's going to be absolutely wonderful. I am not the uh, only person that has felt some insecurity about uh, the future. Some few years ago, I served on the uh, city council in the city in which I live. And uh, one of the uh, councilmen, uh, when we had a, a hard decision to make would say, I just wish we had a crystal ball. I just like to have a crystal ball. And, and I got thinking, it really would be nice to have a crystal ball. I'd like to have a crystal ball, see what's out there. But sometimes later, sometime later I got reflecting, maybe a crystal ball wouldn't be all that neat because the high councilman or the uh, city councilman really didn't want to have a crystal ball that simply said, let us show you what destiny has decreed. So he didn't really know what was actually going to happen if we made a decision. The idea was if he could see the future from this vantage point of the present, then he could tweak his decision so the future would come out differently. That's what he really wanted. He wanted to use the pre present as a means of being able to control the future. Uh, some time ago, I was talking to my youngest brother, and uh, he said to me, I, I, I really wish I could go back and live a segment of my life over. I would sure do things differently. N no, he wouldn't. He would do the same thing he did before. I mean, he was there and he did what he did, okay? And he wouldn't do things differently unless, see, and that's the trick, unless he had the hindsight, the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding that he now has and then could transport it back in time and then use that so that he could somehow make a difference. So it isn't seeing the future that a person really wants. It's the ability to 
control the future that we're really after. Now, God has not seen fit to give me a crystal ball. What he has seen fit to do is give me today, but with a promise. And the promise is, if I will use my todays and do as he asks me to do, then he can assure me that I will indeed have the kind of future that I want, that there is security out there in the future. Still, I have not given up my hope to someday have my own crystal ball. And if I'm reading the scriptures just right, I just may uh, end up with one. Consider this from section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Angels reside in the presence of God on a globe like a sea of glass and fire, where all things for their glory are manifest, past, present, and future, and are continually before the Lord. The place where God resides is a great Urim and Thummim. The earth in its sanctified and immortal state will be made like unto crystal and be a Urim and Thummim to the inhabitants who dwell thereon. Thereby all things pertaining to an inferior kingdom or all kingdoms of a lower order will be manifest to those who dwell on it. Woohoo, not bad. Huh? How about a whole world that's a crystal ball? But the revelation gets even better. Now listen to this. Each one will have a white stone that will also act as a Urim and Thummim, there's my crystal ball, whereby all things pertaining to the higher order of the king, excuse me, whereby all things pertaining to higher, a higher order of kingdoms will be made known. We can see things of the lesser kingdom. We can see things of the greater kingdom. All of these will be the ours, of course, if we're celestialized and go to the divine place. Therefore, a crystal ball may be in your future as well as in mine. Still, I would like to say that my fascination with presents really has led me to ask some questions. I am impressed that God really does know the future, but still, I want to know how he knows the future. Is God's knowledge of the future based solely on mechanical means? That is, does he know the future only because he resides on a great Urim and Thummim? Further, why is it that God uses his prophetic ability to prove and authenticate himself, to prove that he is the only God and the only power in the universe that des deserves our attention, our worship, our love, and our loyalty? Finally, why does God specifically and energetically prohibit mankind's illicit probing of the future? Why is it that he, he demanded of Israel they were not to play with anything that would somehow cause them to prognosticate outside the bounds which he had set? And today, you know, uh, he doesn't want us to work with tarot cards, and he doesn't want us to play with the Ouija boards. What, what is about tarot cards and Ouija boards that frighten God? Why is he concerned about those kinds of things? Well, this hour, what we're going to do is take a look at the scriptures, and especially the book of Isaiah, in an attempt to answer these questions, find out what's really out there. Now, before Israel entered into the promised land, as they sat out there in what is today Jordan, the Lord gave them a very emphatic warning. From Deuteronomy, he said the following, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them, that is the Canaanites, from before thee. There's a few things that are very interesting about that particular passage. First of all, those verses contain every single Hebrew word that deals with the illicit probing of the future. Every way you could do it is mentioned in those verses. And God says, you are not to do any of these things. Second, the Canaanites lost their right to the land because they practiced divination. Now, 
the scriptures tell us that there were other things that also caused them to forfeit the land. But I believe what the Lord is saying here is that which fueled, that which undergirded all of those other reasons was this insistence on continued divination. They lost their right to the land. Further, it is interesting that God calls this practice abomination. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I often do things that upset the Lord. We can disappoint the Lord. We can even make him sorrow. But it is rare that we would do something that is abominable, for abomination does two things. It angers the Lord, and it causes him to withdraw his spirit. In every case where there has been abomination, the object the abominable object is set for destruction. Sometimes that's an individual. Sometimes that's entire nations. But abomination will indeed bring destruction. There, the, therefore, the Canaanites were indeed destroyed or would have been had, they, had the Israelites done as God wanted them to do. What made these practices abominable for the Canaanites? I mean, they're a pagan people. They probably didn't know any better, right? Wrong. From the Book of Mormon, we have some real insight as to what was going on here and how it was that Canaan, for, for, uh, the Canaanites forfeited, forfeited their right to the land. From 1 Nephi 17, verses 33 through 35, Nephi says this, Do ye suppose that the children of this land, uh, Canaanites, were righteous? Behold, I say unto you, Nay. Do ye suppose that our fathers would have been more choice than they if they had been righteous? I say unto you, Nay. Behold, the Lord esteemeth all flesh as one. He that is righteous is favored of God. But behold, this people had rejected every word of God, and they were ripe in iniquity. Now, notice the Canaanites had had the gospel preached to them. You say, well, when did that happen? Well, for... 38 of the 40 years that the people were supposedly wandering in, the Hebrews were supposedly wandering in the wilderness, they were actually camped at Kadesh Barnea. It's down south. And apparently from there, they were continually probing into Canaan with missionaries, teaching the people what Jehovah wanted them to do, trying to make alliances with them, trying to get Jehovah to be their God. Isn't it interesting that when Rahab, the harlot, talks to the spies, she says, we know what God did for you in Egypt and the crossing of the Red Sea and our hearts melt like wax. Well, if they knew all that, why didn't they convert? Why did they continue to, to fight against Israel? And the answer is, they were hardcore or practiced hardcore divination. That is to say, they insisted in trying to continue to perpetuate a God in contempt of the God of Israel. They said that their God was all-powerful, that their God, or rather gods, were the ones that should be, should be worshipped, in spite of the fact that God had brought to them his word, his message, and his power. Therefore, their continued insistence on having their God and trying to get in touch with their God, and trying to control the future through their God in face of Jehovah's warnings was an abomination and therefore led to their forfeiture of the land. It is of note that that which heads God's list of abominable practices is passing children through fire, a cleansing of passing children through fire. On the surface, that doesn't look like it has anything to do with divination, but in reality, it really does. The prohibition is against worshiping the Ammonite god Molech. One of the ways of worshiping this god was to take little children, babies in fact, and to put them through the fires of Moloch. Many children died, I should tell you that. But fibrillation, that is the practice of, of this ritual of uh, children being passed through the fire, was one of the solid practices of the Ammonites that God found very abominable and therefore forbid Israel to do it. But why were these people practicing fibrillation? And the answer is, Moloch is the god of gods. Now, the, the root of the god's name, Melech, means king, but Moloch isn't king of the gods. 
He is king of everything. He is power and kingship all rolled into one. And of course, the desire of the king is to be able to dictate his own life, to be able to control the future. No worship of any idol has closer relationship to soothsaying and magic than does the worship of Moloch. People worship Moloch. Why? Because he's the king of all. And therefore, by worshiping Moloch, by giving him what he wants, the person buys, as it were, insurance against a future that might be less than kind. Moloch worship, therefore, is an attempt to have a future on the individual's terms, not on the terms set down by Jehovah. Again, God calls this worship, this kind of worship, an abomination. Why? Because the individual tries to get around God, tries to get around God's laws, tries to have a future without God that will bring blessing and security. It's simply not going to happen, God says. You can't get around me. Well, as Jehovah brought Israel into the promised land, he taught them that they were not to think of even trying to get around him and around his commandments. And he continued to teach them this all the way down through the 8th century, when he called Isaiah as his prophet. We see, especially in the 8th century, God once again fighting against divination and against idolatry itself. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look this evening at those scriptures, those prophecies, which Isaiah wrote down in the 8th century, which were fulfilled in the 6th century and the 5th century. Okay? Prophecies that Isaiah wrote down that were not fulfilled for 200 years. Now, before pressing into that study, I uh, would like to just mention one thing. I find it very ironic that the chapters that you and I are going to read this evening together has triggered one of the greatest debates in Isaiah, in Isaiah studies. It all began with Bishop Robert Louth. He was uh, an Anglican bishop, a cleric, and a tremendous scholar. He was an Old Testament poetry expert, wrote a number of super treatises on Old Testament poetry. Now, that brought him right up against prophecy because the prophetic voice in the Old Testament is the poetic voice. You can't divorce them. When God speaks in the Old Testament, he speaks in poetic terms. And so Louth was going through the Old Testament, looking for poetical forms, and he found over and over again this prophetic power. And he was impressed, he says, with the genius of the prophetic consciousness in Israel's prophets. That is the ability to see and to declare the way society is going. These prophets had a tremendous sensitivity and therefore could de declare to people, we keep this up, we're going to end up over there, and I don't think we want to end up over there. In his study, he determined, however, that, and I'm paraphrasing and quoting from him, the prophets were, after all, quote, men of like nature with ourselves in virtually all respects. He went on to say, it was, quote, only their higher moral natural sensibilities that really set them apart, unquote. He just decided that prophets were not superhuman, that they were very, very mortals, like him, like other people. They possessed a, a very highly developed sense of justice and an extremely acute ability to see the direction in which society was headed, but that's all they possessed. Then guess what? Louth run right into Isaiah chapters 40 through 48. And he didn't know what to do when he ran into chapters 40 and 48. He said that there existed in this section of Isaiah a strange temporal reference. Strained temporal reference. What did he mean? He meant that in these chapters, Isaiah was demonstrating a power beyond that which genius could grant unto him, that a sensitivity to social injustice could grant unto him. He was able to see beyond the horizon of his own time, and Lao said, I simply don't buy it. No mortal can see beyond 
the uh, horizon of his own time. You can't sit in this 8th century and see things that are going to take place 200 years later plus in the 6th century. It ain't possible. And that was his strained temporal reference. Well, acute dissonance set in to uh, Bishop uh, Louth, and uh, he insisted, to applaud prophetic genius in respect to ethical insight is one thing, but to claim for the same genius the ability to foresee events centuries in advance went beyond all enlightened logic. If you're enlightened and you're logical and you're a thinker, one thing you cannot do is buy the fact that Isaiah could see 200 years in the future. It doesn't work. If you're a thinking, sentient individual, you cannot buy this stuff. Well, he raises the issue. Guess what? His, his dissonance was passed on to the 19th century. A number of scholars, especially those in Germany, really took a look at Isaiah and said, gosh, this stuff really is there. And during that time, Isaiah as fourth teller and as Isaiah as foreteller became incompatible principles. What did the scholars do to resolve the problem, to somehow quell the dissonance? They invented, without any historical evidence whatsoever, another Isaiah. They call him Deutero-Isaiah, for lack of another name. The first Isaiah lived in the 8th century. He is the author of Isaiah chapters 1 through 39. But there was this later Isaiah, this Deutero-Isaiah, who is the author of chapters 40 through 66. And therefore, it's no wonder that the first Isaiah perfectly understood and described the 8th century, and the other Isaiah perfectly understood and described the 6th century. They were two different Isaiahs. And somewhere along the way, the poetry of one got stitched to the poetry of the other, and Allah, we have the book of Isaiah today. It is interesting to me that in order for scholars to continue to separate out the dissonance, they have now invented up to four, some would even push five Isaiahs. As they really take a look at the Isaiah message, I said, no, no, there's got to be another one, or there's got to be another two, there's got to be another three in this whole thing. And it's interesting to me that all of these polymorphs of Isaiah all come from one idea, that a human being is incapable, no matter how bright, is incapable of seeing beyond the horizon of his or her own time. Now, let me tell you, as a scholar, I buy it. I hope you didn't lose your testimony on that one because I have a little more to say. But the truth of the matter is, I honestly do believe, no matter how acute the mind, no, no matter how great the perception, human beings cannot see beyond the horizon of their own, hot, own time unless they are inspired by God who can see all time and who has the ability to be able to reveal all time to those who are his children. Therefore, I would say that Isaiah 40 through 48 show God deliberately expressing his power of prescience, okay, that portion of omniscience that deals with his ability to see the future, to show Israel that he is God and the only God whom they are to worship and the only God with whom they are to have to do. Now, all the scriptures, not just Isaiah, testify that God knows the future. For example, Alma testifies that God has all power and all wisdom and all understanding, and he comprehendeth all things. God himself says that, and this is from the DNC, says that he is the same which knoweth all things, for all things are present before mine eyes, and that all things are present with me, for I know them all. Okay, that last was from Moses 1.6. Now, how can he do this? Alma has the answer. Except he was God, he could not know these things. Notice that prescience is an attribute of deity. Gods have the power. Why? Because they are gods. But the question is, again, does God see the future and reveal it, or does God engineer the future and share with us what he makes happen? In other words, 
does the future exist for God as something already concrete and unchangeable, but which he can see? In which case, prophecy is God's sharing his vision with humankind. In other words, prophecy allows us to see from his height the inevitable course of events flowing through the stream of destiny. It's one model. Or is the future fluid because it is something that God creates? In that case, God knows the future because he predetermines the course through which history will flow. Prophecy then becomes God sharing with us the direction in which he is moving history. So which is it? Joseph Smith had something to say about God's ability to foresee the future. To quote, The great Jehovah contemplated the whole of the events connected with the earth pertaining to the plan of salvation before it came rolling into existence or ever the morning star sang together for joy. The past, the present, and the future were and are with him one eternal now. He goes on to say that God knew of the fall of Adam, the iniquities of the ad, uh, antediluvians, and so on. That he comprehended the fall of man, his redemption, and so on. That he saw the destinies of all nations. And then Joseph says, and he ordered all things according to the counsel of his own will. He knows the situation of both the living of the dead and has made ample provision for their redemption. Does living or seeing from the perspective of the eternal now mean that things are static? That everything that has existed does now exist or that ever will exist actually abide in a static state before God right now? Is it all present before him right now? On the surface, I would say that the prophets statement looks like things are indeed static. That things are now set and that God therefore is the observer and shares with his, his observation. But that is not necessarily the case. Note that Joseph says that God ordered all things according to the counsel of his own will. He ordered things according to the counsel of his will. That suggests that God shares with humankind his ordering, how he has ordered things to make the future the future as he had wanted. Therefore, God creates the channel in which history flows and through the prophet shares with us what he intends to do. History in that case is neither in inevitable nor fated until God makes it so. Well, okay. Which one of these two models does Isaiah support? So let's now turn to the writings of Isaiah and see what we can learn from him. Now to set the stage, 8th century, Isaiah's period, many of those who belong to the northern kingdom of Israel have already turned to idolatry. Some have even challenged the right of Jehovah to, be, to proclaim himself as the only God who should demand their attention. To these Isaiah asks, and I read now from Isaiah 40. 21 through 24. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he, meaning Jehovah, that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. It is he that stretcheth out the, stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. It is he that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth a vanity, that is to say uh, nothing. Yea, they shall not be planted. They shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root. And he shall also blow upon them. And they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. Notice that Isaiah shows us that God is the creator, not only of the earth, but also the creator of kings and peoples. And he chooses whether they will flourish or whether they will not flourish based upon the reverence that they give to him. Isaiah, however has not, excuse me, Israel, however, has not recognized this fact, and therefore Isaiah castigates them with these words. This is uh, Isaiah 40, beginning with 27. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? 
Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to him that have not might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew in their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles and shall run and be weary and shall walk and, I should say, they shall be run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now notice what he says. Israel really believes that God does not know where they're about. And why? Because he takes a vacation. He takes some time off. He's got to go rest for a while and therefore they can get away with stuff. And Israel said, you really think this? Let me tell you, God never wearies ever. In fact, he never faints Rather, he is the one who strengthens those who might faint. Yeah, the youth may faint, but those who are his, he gives them power. Isaiah goes on to show what, uh, to what extent God controls the future. Reading from Isaiah 41.2, he asks, Who raised up the righteous man? Now, he hasn't named a name here, but he is talking about Cyrus. He will name Cyrus later on, but... This is a little foreshadowing, okay? Who raised up the righteous man and from the east? He's talking about Persia, but he hasn't named Persia yet. Who, who raised up the righteous man from the east, who called him to his foot, gave the nations before him and made him ruler over the kings. He, God, gave them as the dust of his sword and as driven stu stubble uh, to his bow. He, Cyrus, passeth them and passeth safely, even by the way that he should go. Excuse me, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Everything falls to him. Even, even when he's not been out there conquering, the nations just say, ah, give up. We will be yours. Just don't come and beat us up. So he's going to conquer lands that he's never sent troops into before. Woo! This is some guy. And how come he will be able to do that? Because Jehovah is with him, preparing the way. Isaiah then drives home his point with a question and an answer. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and the last, am he. Now, these verses show us that God creates history. This is the reason, at least in part, why he can reveal the future to his people. It's all under his control. He makes it happen. Now, because he overmasters history, Joseph can assure Israel that, and I read here from chapter 41, starting with 17, when the poor and the needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land spring of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shita tree, the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree, the pine, the box, to, uh, box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Now notice, in this verses, he is not talking about his ability to be able to control peoples and nations. He is saying, I also control the world. I control the elements. I control nature. Now, imagine somebody who can control peoples and powers and also control nature. That is a being with tremendous control. So, God says then, on this basis to Judah and then later to scattered Israel, when I decide to bring you back, when I decide to give you my power, nothing is going to be able to hinder you. But having said that, I realize I'm just a little ahead of myself, so let me go on with Isaiah's writings. Isaiah did not warn the northern kingdom alone. He also warned the southern kingdom, that is, to Judah. He knew and prophesied that Judah, like their northern neighbors, would eventually fall to idolatry, and be destroyed with Babylon being the agent, God's tool. The question was, if Judah rejects God, will she be destroyed utterly, or is there any hope of salvation for her? And again, Isaiah has, has the answer. This from Isaiah 43, uh, starting with uh, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and hath formed thee, O Israel, 
fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have caused, called thee by, name, by thy name. Thou art mine, when thou passest through waters, I will be with thee, and, though the, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through fire, thou shalt not be burnt, neither shall the flame kindle upon me. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Notice, when God pulls these people back, when he commands them to come back, they don't have to fear fire or water, no element at all. Nothing can stop them. Why? Because God is in control of the elements, and those elements will be at the beck and call of those whom he assigns. So note that God's, note God's assurance that nothing will be able to stop his people because nothing can stop him. He can assure Israel, therefore, that she is to, and I quote here from Isaiah 43, starting with verse 5, she is to fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, every one that is called by my name, for I have created him in my glory. I formed him, yea, I made him. When I call him back, Nothing's going to stop them. They are mine. I made them, I formed them, and when I want them gathered, they will indeed be gathered back. So the scriptures we have read thus far, that is in these three chapters, reveal a lot concerning our particular study. They show us that God not only sees, but also controls the past, the present, and the future. These, verse, these verses pinpoint three ways in which God does so. First, through the manipulation of physical elements. Fire, water, nothing can stop or hurt his people. Second, by being able to call people who will actually do his will. He chooses whom he will call, and he knows whom he will call, and he can count on them to do his will. Finally, he empowers those he calls who are set on doing his will so that nothing can stop them in bringing forth the kind of thing that he wants done. In sum, the scriptures show us how God controls history, past, present, future, and the destiny of all nations. He has power over individuals, nations, and the very elements, and therefore he cannot be stopped. Now, having demonstrated the power of his prescience, the Lord now drives home his point. Israel is to worship him and him alone. They are not to worship idols. And therefore, Isaiah offers a challenge to any idol and any idol worshiper. This challenge is found in Isaiah 43, 8. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this? and show us former things. Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Let them hear and say it is true. God's throwing out the challenge. The gauntlet is down. And, and what is the litmus test of, of, of validity? Prophecy. Okay, you want to worship idols? Okay, you got some idols out there. Let's just have a little court case here and bring in your witness and you show me when an idol prophesied and when it came to pass. Just do it. Bring in your witnesses. I want to see this thing. Notice he, he first challenges the Jews, that is the, those who are blind with eyes and deaf with ears, but then he just broadens it out to all nations, not just the Jews. Hey, anybody, I'm willing to take anybody on here. Idols must prove their worth. Can't do it. But the Lord is very willing to show that he can do it. Thus from Isaiah 44, starting with verse 24. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, uh, he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord, I maketh all things, that maketh all things, that stressed forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by itself. I am the one that frustrateth the tokens of the liars and maketh diviners mad. I turneth wise men backwards and make their knowledge foolish. That confirmeth the word unto his service, servants and performeth the counsel of his messengers. That saith to Jerusalem, thou shalt be inhabited. And to the cities of Judah ye shall be built. And I will raise up and uh, raise up the decayed places thereof. That saith unto the deep, be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform my pleasure, ever saying to, it, to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built unto the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Now note, 
God's insistence of how it works. He created all things. Now, the point is, he didn't just create all things and then walk away. He is the creator, which means he was the creator in the past, but he is also the creator in the presence. Right now, he's saying to Israel, I am creating these things that we may be able to move forward and to move forward with power. Further, because he is creating, he can frustrate the diviners so that their prophecies cannot come to pass. But so far as his prophets are concerned, he can make sure that their prophecies absolutely come to pass because he is at head. And then, to really pull it off, he gives the tu de gras to idols. He names the agent that will be his servant, Cyrus. Now, to understand the uh, power of this prophecy, brothers and sisters, let me just give you a thumbnail sketch. Isaiah is prophesying somewhere around 740 B.C. The northern kingdom of Israel at that time is intact. Everything is going well with her. It will take 20 years before she will finally fall to the Assyrians. That's about 721 B.C. It will take over 100 years before the Assyrians fall to the Babylonians. That's about 609 B.C. Then 20 additional years will be needed before the Babylonians destroy Judah in 589. Then another 40 years before Cyrus will be able to successfully lead the Persians uh, 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 in an assault against Babylon, uh, approximately 550 for that one. Only then will he be in a position to be able to free Judah to return home. And then it will take him 12 years to do that, so he finally gets around to it in 537. Isaiah, in 740, names the man and the deed that will take place in 537. That is impressive. What soothsayer, what divining priest could actually name the name and the deeds of someone who would be born 200 years in the future? Now, the specificity of this revelation does not end there. That's very impressive. For me, that's enough. But God goes on in Isaiah 45. He assures the Persian king that, thus saith the Lord to his anointed, that's to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdued nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings. I will open before him the two leaf gates and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee, I will make crooked paths straight, I will break in pieces the gates of brass, I will cut asunder the iron bars, I will give thee uh, the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of the secret places, that thou mayest know that I am the Lord, which call thee by name, and I am the God of Israel. Now, these verses assure Cyrus's success. What you will conquer will stay conquered for as long as you're king. And it's interesting, Cyrus was able to push the Persian Empire to the greatest empire in his day that the world had ever seen. He did very successfully bring the whole thing up. It is also interesting that God says to him, I will give you riches, not simply the riches that can be seen, but even those that are hidden away that you're not to get to. Cyrus did it. I mean, he was able to accumulate wealth. So successful was this king as both general and diplomat that it is hard to separate myth from history. But this we know, this is, this is uh, pretty solid. From one state alone, the Elydian state, it's in Turkey, Cyrus extracted 250 millions of dollars in today's money. Not bad, huh? Wouldn't you like to be a king and have God on your side and even the hidden treasures are going to come flowing into your coffers? Sounds pretty good to me. Now, what I'd like you to understand, though, is God did not give these prophecies to impress Cyrus nor even to make Cyrus successful. What he was doing was trying to impress Cyrus so that Cyrus would be Cyrus's agent. But even there, the objective is not to convert a pagan. The objective is to convert Israel. And therefore, everything God did for Cyrus was to prove to Judah that God was God and that he knew the future. From Isaiah 45, starting with verse 4, For Jacob, my servant, uh, for Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name, speaking of Cyrus, I have surnamed thee, that thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God besides me. I girded thee, 
that thou mayest not, uh, though thou hast not known me, that, th that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me, they referring to Judah. I am the Lord, there is none else. I form the light, I create the darkness, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now notice, the Lord impresses his ability upon the future king, but he lets that future king, or excuse me, he lets Judah know that that future king is doing his will that Judah might come to Jehovah and thereby be saved in all things. I am impressed that it worked. Cyrus really was very taken with the prophecy. I read this from Josephus, the uh, first century Jewish historian, first century AD Jewish historian. In the first year of the reign of Cyrus, which was the seventh from the day that our people were removed out of the land of Babylon, God commiserated the captivity and calamity of these poor people. For he stirred up the mind of Cyrus and made him write thus to all of Asia. Thus saith Cyrus the king, since God Almighty hath appointed me to be king of the habitable earth, I believe that he is that God which, nations, uh, which the nation of the Israelites worship. For indeed, he foretold my name by the prophets, and that I should build him a house in Jerusalem in the country of Judea. It's the end of the decree. Josephus. The, this was known to Cyrus by his reading of the book of Isaiah, which the prophet left behind. Now notice, the Lord, by prophecy, was able to move Cyrus. Never gave Cyrus a direct revelation, because Cyrus was a pagan. But because of a prophet who was inspired of God, Cyrus read the prophecies and was moved. Hey, there is truth in this matter, and therefore I will restore Judah, and I will see that her temple is indeed built. Uh, <clears throat> As we take a look then at these scriptures, which I have read, and I should say this, I could have read quite a few more, but for the sake of time, I want to bring this to a close. We can see that the past, the present, and the future really are with God, that he can display his power. Verse, Isaiah chapter 48, starting with verse 6. I will show thee new things from this time, even hidden things that thou didst not know. They are created now and not from the beginning, even before the day when thou heardest them not, lest thou should say, Behold, I knew them. Yea, thou heardest them not, yet thou knowest not. Yea, from the time that thine ear was not opened, for I knew that thou wouldst deal treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. What God is saying right there is, okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to start fulfilling future right now, okay? I am going to show you things right now, meaning that as Isaiah delivers the prophecy, God sets history on its course. And what is that history? Well, it's the, the history that we find in the rest of the book of Isaiah. It's the power of Babylon. It's the fall of Judah. It's the restoration of Judah. Uh, then it's the refall of Judah and then the gathering of Israel in the last days. The whole book then is full of what God now sets in course. God therefore shows to Judah and to Israel exactly and precisely what he is, that he is indeed the God of the future. Therefore, we can see God's relationship to the future. First, History verifies God's power of prescience. Ancient Judah was indeed destroyed, or captivated, captive. The temple was destroyed. Judah was returned. The temple was rebuilt. The waste places did again blossom and so on. Therefore, Isaiah's writings show us just how precisely God does know the future. Second, we see why God forgive, for, forbids the illicit probing of the future. Idols are nothing. He proves that. There is nothing there. Therefore, they cannot in any way influence the future. He is the only God of the future. Therefore, divination is, in the best case scenario, a waste of time. In a moderate case scenario, a display of faithlessness. And in the worst case scenario, nothing short of an act of hubris. An individual trying to become a law unto himself and redefining the cosmos to his own making and trying somehow to skirt God and God's commandments. It just simply cannot happen. 
Therefore, just a couple of points. Prescience and foreknowledge as attributes of God describe more than a very accurate ability to predict. God knows the future not just because he has ordered all things according to the counsel of his own will, but also because he is actively involved in the present moment by moment, thus shaping the future. There is, however, even more to his power than that. I have often heard people say that God's foreknowledge is solely a function of his prolonged and discerning familiar, familiarity with us in the premortal existence. There is no doubt in my mind that that does help a whole lot. But is that all? I don't think so. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said that we must see God's foreknowledge in terms of the stunning reality that the past and present and future are part of an eternal now with God. That he abides there. God simply has knowledge and vision beyond anything that those of us trapped in our little tiny three dimension can even begin to comprehend. Therefore, prophecy does not refer to the ability to extrapolate, to guess, to deduce, to conjure what is coming. The word denotes a knowledge possessed by God, given to his prophets through the spirit by which the future is known. Prophecy is not God's guessing about or even predicting the future, but his sharing with us an absolute concrete reality. Thus, we can trust in that foreknowledge, allowing its display to do for us what God designed it to do for Israel, to let us know he is the only God, but that he is the God of the future, and therefore all those who will do his will will find a future secured for them. Thus, let me end with this. Those of us who live in troubled times, prophecy can be an anchor to our soul, sure and steadfast. God knows what is coming because God is shaping what is coming. And he is shaping what is coming for the benefit and blessing of those who are his. Indeed, God's future is our salvation, if we will, unlike Judah and Israel, hear the call, believe that he is the one true God, and follow after his ways. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu.